If you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. It's great to be gathered here today with uh, my church family. Is it good to be gathered with your church family? I do want you to know what's been on my heart recently. Um, I mean, I just, I believe that we, the church needs revival. And revival doesn't mean that a bunch of people get saved. What it means is the saved people start living for Jesus Christ. So I've just been praying for that, for revival. I do believe that, and of course this happens a lot throughout history. The church just kind of gets lazy or uh, I don't even know what you would say they're getting unbiblical and uh, we need revival and I just wanted to say that it has nothing to do with my message um, if you're a believer today you you are incredibly blessed you have every reason to be joyful and um, feel alive if you're a believer today you are incredibly blessed and in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, tell us about uh, that blessing. And really, they're the most eye-opening scriptures, um, really, in much of the Bible. They're eye-opening when you read them and understand them. In verses 1 through 3, Ephesians 2 tells us the condition that you were in before you were saved, and it was not a good condition. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10 10, help us understand what God did for us by saving us. Now, last week, we looked at that desperate condition that we were in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and let me just read that. Before you're saved, this is what you're like. The Bible says, and you were dead, I mean spiritually dead, not physically dead, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too also formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. So before you're saved, that's how you live, in the lust of your flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That's what you indulge yourself in. That's what you went by, was your flesh, your desires, not God's. And we're by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So you were on your way to hell. Now, what this means is, and we talked about this last week, is that we were spiritually dead, we were sinfully depraved, and we were absolutely doomed. We were in a mess. We were in a mess. And there was nothing we could do about it because we were spiritually dead. And we had no ability to do anything about it. That was our condition before you're saved. You cannot save yourself. So you're in a lot of trouble. You're on your way to hell and there is nothing you can do about it. And then he comes to verse 4 in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, but God. But God. And by the way, that's who changed everything. God. In your life, it is God who changes everything for you. It is, if you're a believer today, trust me, God, your parents had, did not save you. They can't save you. I know some people say, well, I was born in a Christian home and I was raised up in a Christian home and all my life I've known Jesus. Guys, there has to be a moment in your life where you trust Jesus Christ. Your parents can't save you. Your pastor cannot save you. Your friends can't save you. The change that comes in your life comes from God. But God. And, and, and how blessed you are 
today if you're a Christian. If you're a child of God, you're blessed. And I hope you know that being saved by God is the greatest blessing that a person can experience. That's one of the reasons why I'm not envious against Super Bowl champions. They don't impress me at all. Well, I mean, i got to say, they can play football, right? I mean, some of those catches are pretty amazing, aren't they? But they don't, I don't think they have it any better off than I do. Why? I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I have eternal life. Uh, the, the, somebody might win the Olympic gold medal. Doesn't, you know, they don't have it better than me. Although they're talented. <laughs> They don't have it any better. Why? Because I have eternal life. That is the greatest blessing that a person can experience in their life. And if you have that, and when I say when you, if you have that, if you just have that, if that's all you have, you are blessed beyond your wildest dreams. You know when I say you're blessed, you know that I'm not talking about financial blessings. I am not talking about temporal blessings, blessings that you get in this life. When I say you're blessed, I'm not talking about the possessions you have or the profits that you make or the, pose or, or, or the uh, prestige or positions that you have. I'm not talking about that kind of a blessing. And I'm certainly not talking about uh, physical pleasure. I'm not talking about those blessings guys those things come and go in people's lives and the truth of the matter is if you study what the world's uh, the shape of the world most people don't have these kind of blessings that you do in america if they come here they would think they died and gone to heaven already there's a lot of people in the world that can't even begin to understand how we have how good we have it here in this country so I am not talking about those kind of blessings. I'm talking about spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings. And if you're a genuine believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have those blessings. You have eternal life. You have inner peace. Guys, there's people that will give billions of dollars for the inner peace that you have. They'd give all their money away for the inner peace that you have. You have inner peace. You have unconditional love. You have a living hope. You, you have, did I say you had eternal life? Did I mention that? You have eternal life. You are blessed. And people say, well, what about my problems? You know, I hear Christians talk about their problems and their complaints about their problems. You know, and obviously I, I, we need to be sensitive and tender to people about their problems. But quite frankly, guys, we all got those. Uh, one, of, uh, one of my friends, Josh Sanchez, uh, wrote a song one time. The title was, I've Got My Own Set of Blues. So what do you mean, what about my problems? We all have problems. Guys, only believers have the wonderful, life-changing, overwhelming, consuming blessings that come from God. Only believers have that. Lost people don't have that. And if you're a believer and you walk around in this world and you see all of the sadness and the sorrow and the heartache and the confusion and the fear that people have, it's because they don't have spiritual blessings. They don't have that. Eternal life is the greatest blessing that you'll ever have. You know, believers, we don't go around fearing like the world does I, this COVID-19 thing has blown me away to be honest with you how much fear is in our world and in our country uh, and I'm not I'm not I don't want to make light of of the seriousness of it because it, it is serious and many many people have died from it and it is a fact but you know people all of us are going to die from something We all are. 
And matter of fact, I know a lot of people that have been scared to death over COVID-19, and there's been millions of people who have died of other things, and that person's still alive. What are they afraid of? But the, the lost world is afraid. Christians, un, believers in Jesus Christ, we don't live with that kind of fear because we have everlasting life. We're not afraid of cancer. We're not afraid of that. Look, guys, cancer cannot kill you if you're a Christian. It'll mess up your body and you'll fall down and, you know, the doctors will get all your money too in the process. But that cancer cannot kill you. You're still alive. You're alive. See, that's the blessings of being a Christian. Christian Christians aren't afraid of global warning, warming. You know, I, I was watching the news the other day, and they said the water is rising up. It's going to go up another foot in 10 years and another two foot and whatever. I'm thinking, well, that's why God made mountains. You know, so what if we have to move our oceanfront property in a mile that's we adapt we adapt to what's happening in the climate that's nothing new i i'm not afraid of global warming now i will be i will be going to that mountain by the way if the water starts <clears throat> i mean i don't i'm not i'm not afraid to die but i'm not you know gonna just do stuff to make myself die <clears throat> we're not afraid of inflation. We were talking, some of the um, other folks, we were talking about how expensive prices are going up, and they are. Have you noticed that? And people are getting afraid. You know, I could do without eating some bacon. <laughs> I could cut back on bacon, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> no comment. You know what, we, okay, I go up on a mountain, I go on a diet. You know, that, well, why do we fear these kind of things? When you are a child of God, you are a blessed person. And sure, you got problems, but so does everybody else, and we are not supposed to live in fear. Nothing this world does to you can change what God has done for you. We're saved and we're blessed and we're going to have, we're saved right, we're blessed right now and guys, our future is even better. This is not your best life now. And you better hope it's not because <laughs> actually our best life is in the future. I don't know about you, but that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to, I'm a Christian, what should I be doing? Looking forward to the next life. I don't live for this life. I live in it, and I live for the Lord now, but I don't live for this life. I'm living for the next one, the one that's going to last forever. And I'm looking forward to it. So we're all blessed. Now before that, we, we were in trouble. The Bible says here in verse 4, let me read this. This is uh, the blessings. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that, this is why he did all this, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works. So that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, last week we looked at what we were before we were saved. We were, we were dead, 
we were depraved and we're doomed. This week I want to talk about what we are after we're saved. In Ephesians 4, verse 10, 4 through 10, we are regenerated. These are the three points. We're regenerated. We are raised, raised up. And that's now, that happens now in your life once you're saved. And you are revealed. And that's going to happen in the future. That does not happen now. You'll, you're revealed. So he says here in verse 4, but God being rich in mercy, I mean, he doesn't say God's merciful. He says rich in mercy because of his great love. By the way, it takes rich mercy and great love to save a sinner like you and me because there's really no reason to do it. Rich mercy and great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Here, here it is, underline these words, he made us alive. He made us alive. This is the doctrine of regeneration. That's what this is. It is it's the same as being born again when Jesus said you must be born again. Uh, it's, it's, being, it's this idea, I was born once physically, and the second time I'm born again spiritually and we're born he made us alive together with christ by grace you have been saved so it says here you made us alive now what does regeneration mean we've talked about this before this is an important doctrine guys regeneration here it is on your outline regeneration is when god by his grace acts upon, you, upon the heart of a man or a woman so that their rebellious nature is changed. That's what regeneration is. When God, by grace, it's no merit of yours, he didn't look down in the future and said, oh, that's going to be a good guy, I'll regenerate them. Or he doesn't look at your life right now and say, oh, they're going to church or they're a nice person, I'm going to regenerate them. It has nothing to do with you. Remember, this happened way back in eternity past. He made this decision. So, regeneration is when God, by his grace, acts upon the heart of a man or a woman and so that their rebellious nature is changed. That's what He makes them alive spiritually. And before a person is born again, basically their overall attitude is opposed to God. Now, of course, we know that there are lost people that are nice and they do nice things and there's philanthropists and, and there's kind-hearted piracy because just because you're lost and just because you're a sinner, that doesn't make you a serial killer. But your overall nature and bend is opposed to God. It's opposed to God. And regeneration changes that. It makes it to where you're not opposed to God anymore. Regeneration turns a person from ignoring God to loving God. It changes a person from, uh, you know, God's not really that big of a deal in my life to someone to where now God is the absolute center of their life. So basically there is a reversal of the natural sin for nature sinful nature that we're born with. And then after regeneration, we are a new creation. That's what the Bible says. And now our natural bend is to love God and want to please God. Now, we don't do that perfectly. None of us do. Why? Because we still have our sinful nature. We didn't get rid of that, unfortunately. It's still with us. But we now we have a divine nature, a godly nature, a new nature, that has a bend toward God and loving God and pleasing God. Titus put it this way, or Paul writing to Titus, it says this, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. That's not why he saved us, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration, that's the process of salvation. He washed us. 
He regenerated us. And renewing by the Holy Spirit, that's the same thing as being born again, being made alive, the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So if Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're alive. You are alive. And if Jesus Christ is not your Savior, you're dead. You're dead. You're dead, you're depraved, and you're doomed. But if he is your Savior, you're alive, you are rich spiritually, and you're a new person. Now, some people think that claiming to be a Christian makes you one. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why people get that thought is because preachers tell them that. If you claim to believe, all you have to do is say you believe. That's what they do. That's the invitation. That is the preaching. That is the message from many pastors throughout the world. You say you believe, you're good. But guys, there is nothing further from the truth. You can't just claim to be a Christian and, well, that, okay, it's done then. That's it. You're a Christian. That's not how it works. There has to be a work of God. God has to work in your heart. God has to come into you and change you. And if that work has been done, guess what happens? You change. And people say, you know, I know people, they say they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I can't tell any difference between them and, and uh, you know, the guy at the bar on Saturday night. They cuss like a sailor. No offense to sailors, by the way. They cuss. They drink. They look women up and down. I can't tell any difference. There's no change. And maybe it's not that radical, because you know, I think that's pretty bad. That's pretty radical. Sinner, that's a pretty bad sinner. But it might be other things. But there's no change in their life. I want to, let me ask you something. If somebody was, if you went to a funeral and the guy had been dead for three or four days and then they got up out of the cast and start walking around, do you think you'd notice that change? you say, wow, you're feeling better. You know? Yeah, I thought you're dead. Guys, that's the kind of change that should be seen and the difference between an unbelieving lost person and when they get saved, they're changed. That's the difference. Because you're alive. Dead people cannot act like Christians. They don't have it in them. They just cannot act like a Christian. They're dead. Depraved people cannot even, they can't even fake it. They can't fake it, and they're doomed. They're doomed. So I don't want to be that preacher that says that all you have to do is say you believe, and then that's fine, you're going to go to heaven. No, I'm going to be that preacher that says that Jesus Christ has to be the Lord of your life. And then you can go to heaven. So we're regenerated. We're made alive. The second thing is we're raised. It says here in verse 6, We and raised us up with him. Now guys, what this is, this is spiritual resurrection. That's what this is. It's not physical resurrection. You're going to get that later on. But it's spiritual resurrection that happens at the moment of your salvation to be raised up from the dead. Spiritual resurrection. Now guys, what this means is we are delivered from being beaten down by the sin of this world, even my own sin. And we are delivered by, from being defeated by sin and being discouraged by this world. That's what this idea is. We're, we're raised up out of the world. We're no longer living in defeat and discouragement and, and sin overwhelming us. We're raised up. Before you're saved, 
you're in this world. That's where you are. Before you're saved, you're in this world. And this world, according to this passage and in many other places, it, it's seen as being down. You know, heaven's up. I guess it, you know, we say that hell's down, but also the world is down. It's lower than heaven. And it's low and it's sinful and there's a lot of sorrow and sadness and there's a lot of crying and there's dying in this world. And God says, I'm going to raise you up out of that. I'm going to regenerate you, but I'm going to raise you up with Christ. I'm going to give you spiritual resurrection. I think the old hymn writer, uh, Harold Smith is his name. Maybe he's my relative. Who knows? But he's an old hymn writer, <clears throat> and he pictured <coughs> us drowning in sin when he wrote these words. He said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. That's a great hymn, isn't it? Verse 4, again, but God, <coughs> being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we were dead, he made us alive together with him. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. That's what we are. We are raised up and we're seated, it, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now that word together, it's a significant Christian doctrine. Because what he's talking about, it teaches us that we are at union with Christ. I'm at union with Jesus Christ. And my friends, that distinguishes us, Christians, from the world. That I'm at union with him. I'm not distinctive just because I admire and worship Jesus. That does not make me distinctive because I do that, because I admire and worship Jesus. Lost people fake that every Sunday all over the world. They fake that. They fake that they admire Jesus, and they fake that they're worshiping him. They do it all over the world constantly. Maybe they're not faking. Maybe they really think they're doing it. But you know, a lost person can't worship God. Because you have to worship him in spirit and truth. They don't have either. But that's not what makes me distinctive. I'm also not distinctive just because I live by a certain moral standard found in the Bible. Lost people do that too. Many people understand that the, uh, <coughs> the scriptures have good things in them and they try to follow those whether they look at it as the bible or not they still try to follow those moral standards <coughs> what makes me different and if you're a christian today what makes you different is that in eternity past god decided Sometime in your life, he would make you alive. You remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago? God chose you before he made the foundation of the world. What makes you distinctive is that in eternity past, God decided sometime in your lifetime, he was going to make you alive, and he was going to place you in union with Jesus Christ's resurrection, with his ascension, has not happened with you yet, with his ascension <coughs> and his glorification. So you are united with Christ. That's what makes you distinct. 
And every day when you live your life, you need to remember that, that you are, you're not just some person in the world. You are united with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in union with him. And if you're a believer, you are different, not because of what you do, but because of what God did. That's why you're different. Now, I want to ask Christians to do something for me today. <clears throat> okay? Y'all ready? Don't ever go through another day with low self-esteem. Don't ever do that again. You absolutely have no reason to do it. If you're a Christian, if you're born again, if you're at union with Christ, if you've been regenerated, if you've been raised up with the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no reason for you to have low self-esteem. Don't ever go through another day uh, questioning whether your life has value or worth or purpose. Of course it does. You're in union with Christ. You're a child of God. You're a child of the King. And look, it doesn't matter how much money you make or what kind of job you have. And again, I don't have anything against Super Bowl winners, but I think they're overrated compared to a believer in Christ who has eternal life. It doesn't matter if you're not a famous movie star or some powerful political leader, you are at union with Christ. He is the king of the universe, and you're not going to get any higher than that. I'm telling you, you're not. It kind of makes, when we admire people that do great human feats in the world, it almost makes it a little humorous when you compare it to what God has done for you. He's given you eternal life. So please don't have low self-esteem anymore. There's really no reason for you to. You're at union with Christ. Now, if you're a believer, don't ever count yourself down and out. Don't ever do that. You don't need to do that because you're not down and out. You're not. You're, gonna, you're up. And you're going to be out of this world pretty soon. But you're up. Now, the world, they don't have that. There's plenty of reasons why lost people and unbelievers and unsaved people, they have plenty of reasons to be depressed and discouraged and sad and sorrowful. and They have plenty of reasons to do that. They don't have the hope that Christians have. And again, I, don't, I'm, I, I pray that they are saved. I pray that God would save them. But they don't have what you have. All they have is the worldly pleasures, the sinful things of life to, to entertain them. And every once in a while, even a lost person may kind of get around a, a Christian and they'll kind of get a little taste of heaven being around that person, but they don't have it themselves. Look at this next verse, verse 6. It says, And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God, immediately after you are saved, you start experiencing a foretaste of heaven. Immediately. Immediately. You start experiencing the love of God. You start experiencing the peace that comes from him, the security as a believer that comes from God, that you have a God who is your fortress and he's a present help, uh, present help for you in time of your trouble. He is a shield to you. Just read the scriptures. You get all kinds of love and security and peace. Forever, you get a forever Christian family. I mean, I, I have the, the honor to pastor this small church, but guys, I got plenty more Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. They're all over the world. And they're already 
filling up heaven. So we have a forever Christian family. There is a strength that you get and a courage that you get, and there's an eternal hope that you get. And that happens now. You know, eternal life, when did it start? When you believe. That's when it started. You start to get a foretaste of heaven right now. And guys, it's, when you live in the scriptures and you actually understand all that God has done for you and you understand what eternal life is and you understand how much he loves you and cares about you and you understand what your future is, I'm telling you, this life can be joyful to live in in spite of all of the difficulties. But it's going to get much better in heaven. Much better. I can't wait to where I don't have to watch the news or listen to the news. You know that? Can y'all, what do y'all think about that? I am sick and tired of listening to 24-hour news. I mean, I don't listen to it, but it's just, it's there. You know? This and that and this and that is happening. In God, we, when we get to heaven, we won't have to worry about that stuff, will we? Regenerated, raised up. And the last point I want to make is revealed. So when you're saved, you were dead, you were depraved, you're doomed, but God comes in, he regenerates you, he makes you alive, he raises you up out of this world and starts to give you a foretaste of heaven even now by the way let me say something real quick word about marriage my my wonderful nephew jacob adkins asked uh, his girlfriend to get married recently he asked me to do the wedding so we're going to go up to atlanta in may and perform that wedding Marriage is a wonderful, wonderful thing, guys. And I would say that it is the, a good Christian marriage, a good Christian marriage, godly marriage, because not all marriages are happy. Would, we understand that, right? But a good, God has made it to where a good Christian marriage, where the, where the husband is living for God and the wife is, is living for God and raising those children to live for God. That is the closest thing to heaven here on earth. Amen. It's the closest thing. Mm -hmm. And I've experienced that joy. I know not everybody has, but I have. And I just want to say marriage is a good thing, okay? Let's don't stop. People need to keep getting married. They fall in love. Get married. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And if you're a church member, I don't even charge you. I, I, there's, no, there's no fee for church members. <laughs> our family, our family. Reveal, God's going to reveal us one day. The Bible says, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now look at this, guys. It says that he might show. That's the revealed part. Now what is it that God wants to reveal? What is it that God wants to show? And by the way, write this down somewhere on your outline if you can. Um, what he wants to show is that some, something that, that people did not know previously. It is something that people did not know. So what does he want to show? The surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's what God wants to show. He wants to show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Have you ever heard somebody say, it's not about you? You know, I'm going to say this to you. People say that to you. You know why, people, you know why that phrase has come out? 
Because most of us think it is about me. Most of us live our life as if the world and the universe and everything else revolves around me. It's one of the most sinful things that you can do as a Christian. Is have the universe revolve around you. And I just want you to know today that it does not. The universe does not revolve around you. And God, and people say that, it, you know, it's not about you. It is about God. The, everything's about God. Now see, this is, this is almost foreign thinking to most people. Some of you are thinking, what are you talking about, Pastor? I thought that God was supposed to help me and, and I have a relationship with God because he's going to bless me and do things for me and oh, he loves me and the whole, oh, it's all about me. That's what people think. It's not, it's about God. He's the one who deserves worship, attention. We bless his holy name. He's the one who deserves everything from us. And he has been and will be gracious to us forever, and he wants to show that off. He's going to show off his kindness toward us. That's what he's going to do, guys. I'm glad he wants to do that. And, he, it, and it's all, in, in all of this that we call life, it's not about us, but it's about him and his goodness and his glory and his graciousness and his kindness. Do y'all get that? Are you getting that? It's not about you. It is about his goodness and his graciousness and his kindness and his glory and his plan and his purpose. It's not about you. Now, you get many, many benefits from him. And one of the things that God wants to do, the reason this is his whole eternal plan was to save us by his grace and then show us off. And here's what he's going to do. He is going to, the Bible says, so that in ages to come, he might show the surpassing richness of his grace and kindness toward Jesus Christ. He just wants to show off how kind he's been to us. Now, I want you to know something about the world. They do not know who you are. The world does not, they do not realize who you are. If they did, you would be the most admired person wherever you go. You, if they knew who you were when you went to school, in your school, that you would be the most popular kid in the school. At your workplace, no matter where you work, everybody would look, oh, there, there they go. And they would admire you. But the world does not know who you are. And that's why they don't give you the proper treatment that you deserve. And should be given to a person in your standing. The world doesn't know who you are. So one day, there's going to come a day where God's going to say, look at these people. I chose them before the foundation of the world. And when they were born into this world, I regenerated them. They were dead. They were depraved. They were doomed to hell, but I regenerated them. And I raised them up. And now I am revealing them to all of the universe. And I am saying to all of the universe, I have been gracious and kind to those people. And believe me, the people who weren't gracious and kind to you, they're going to have a problem. God is revealing us that he was rich and kind, rich in mercy and kindness to all of the universe. He's going to show you off. He's going to do it forever. 
you're a trophy of God's grace. Have you ever heard that before? You're a trophy of God's grace. Now, I'm not talking about you're a trophy of your goodness. You're not getting any rewards or awards and all that stuff because you're a great person. God is going to display His graciousness to the universe that He applied to your life. It's not what you did for Him. It is what He did for you. Now, verse 10, or verse 8 through 10, tells us basically there's a couple of reasons why God saved you. Two reasons why God saved you. Look at verse, let's look at the first reason, verse 7, which we just covered, to show us off. He wants to show us off. So that in ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's the way to be saved, by grace through faith. And that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of not a results of work, so that no one may boast. Now look at verse 10. This is the second reason why you were saved. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That means it needs to be an ongoing thing of our life, good works. Walk in them. So what is a good work? I mean, we could go through a long list, but let me just give you this definition. They are works we do that are motivated by a desire to glorify God. So in other words, if you do something good and your motivation is not to glorify God, it's not really a good work. It might be a nice thing or something, but it's not the good work that Paul is talking about here. A lot of people do good things, guys. God gets no glory for it. He gets no credit. Nobody even mentions Jesus' name when they're doing the good work. How can that glorify God? The good work that Paul is talking about here, that God foreordained that we would walk in them and prepared that we would walk in them, is works that are motivated by a desire to glorify God. Second part of the definition. So they're motivated by a desire to glorify God but they are works that glorify God. You know, a lot of people do some good things, and they think they're good, but they're not good at all. I know some people say, you know, I bought my friend a six-pack for his birthday. I'm a good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. I bought my friend some cocaine. There's people who believe, listen guys, and you know this is true. There are people who believe that when they do things like that for their friend, they're being good. You know that, right? They're not. They're not being good. So uh, good works are things that you are motivated by a desire to glorify God. Those, work, those good works actually do glorify God, and they benefit someone else. Now, the words where he says we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ, what that workmanship created, you hear those words, they're really powerful words. You kind of just read through them, but you don't stop and think about it for a second workmanship created what that means is is that god has done a radical work in your life i mean he worked on you he created a new person is what this is talking about so there's this radical change that's happened into your life there you know being you're, there's a transformation there's a transformation Guys, no change, then no salvation. If there is no change in your life, then my friend, I got to tell you, there probably was no salvation in your life. One of the things that churches need to get back to is realizing that I can't really help somebody and lead them to Christ 
until I let them know that they're not in Christ yet. You have to let somebody know you're lost until they're ever going to realize they need to turn to the Lord. And so many people don't even know they're lost. A saved person loves God. A saved person loves God's people. A saved person loves righteousness. That's a saved person. If you don't love God and if you don't love God's people and you don't love righteousness, then you're not saved. Now, they love good works, too. That's what they do. They love good works and they're expected by God to do good works. Um, and the good works were not an afterthought of God. God didn't say, oh, I'm going to save people, and then, oh, by the way, I think I want them to do some good works. It says here, God prepared beforehand so that they would walk in them. So you're saved to serve, and you are saved to do good works. And God's plan is not for you to live a self-centered life ungrateful life he made you alive right he made you alive and he wants you to live for him and this is not ambiguous in the bible it is 100 percent clear in the bible he made you alive and he wants you to live for him he does not want you to live a self-centered ungrateful life so, and all believers do have a deep love for God. And true believers, they just can't sit on the sidelines. They have to get involved. They're the people always saying, what can I do? What can I do? How can I help my church? How can I help somebody in my church? How can I improve my church? Those are the people that are born again. And they love to do it. You can't even stop. They, 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 they do it so much, they might even be an irritant to you. So let me ask you today, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And when I say believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to identify who he is. He is your owner and he's your ruler. Because any other Lord or any other Savior, that's, that's not in the Bible. There is no other Savior in the Bible except Jesus as Lord. He's your owner and he's your ruler. And do you want Jesus to save you? Here's the good news. Look what the Bible says. For by grace you have been saved through faith. He's talking to believers. That's the way everybody gets saved. If you're not saved by grace, you're not saved. If you're not saved through faith, you're not saved. By grace through faith is what the Bible says. It's uh, and not of yourself. It is a gift. It's a gift of God. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. Now, if God is working in your heart today, which he does that with all believers, people who have believed in the Lord, but maybe he's doing that with you today, and you've come to the place in your life right now where you understand that you need God. You understand. You're starting to, starting to hit you. I'm a sinner, and I'm doomed to hell. And it's, that kind of starting to hit you real. God begins to work in your heart. If that's happening to you, I mean, what that is, is God is showing favor in your life. He is being gracious to you right now. And your response, you only have one response, and that is that you believe in Him, that you believe in God, that you believe that He is real, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You have to believe that God is real. That's the first thing. And then you believe the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he died on the cross for your sins. That you are a sinner. And that you desperately need a savior. You believe those things. You come to Christ. 
admit that you're a sinner, you ask God for forgiveness, you know what God will do? He will welcome you with open arms and let you know how much he loves you and cares about you and you will have instant forgiveness. Guys, you have been regenerated. And then he will begin to raise you up out of this sinful, ungodly world that's been holding you down for so long. And he will let you know, one day I'm going to show the whole universe how kind I've been to you. That's our new life in Christ. I hope you have it. Would you pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you for your word. And we ask God that you would apply it to people's hearts today and in a way in which only your Holy Spirit can do. And we pray, Father, that if there's anybody here today that when they came in here, they weren't saved. But today, we pray, God, that you are saving them, that they will just, in simple childlike faith, believe in you. They'll believe that you're real, that there is a God, that that God, that you, our God, our Father, actually spoke to us through your word, through your prophets, and ultimately through your Son. And that message is one of repentance and faith. And anyone who does that, it's wonderful to be able to say, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Any person can do that. And we ask, Lord, that you would save someone today by your grace, through their faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.